sound they had in their, in their yard, um, given that there's a, a limit to three family members to have a party. If underage drinking is the issue, let's address that. If, if noise is an issue that's over the top after 11 o'clock, let's address that. But the language seems to be a little too broad to, in order to be able to address the concerns that the residents that brought this forward to you and I would like to have addressed. So I, I ask your caution in putting something like that in place. Item nine, um, no, I'm sorry, item eight. Um, I personally had several of my neighbors' homes filled up with stormwater during the May 5th uh, storm, consequence of the river rising so fast below the Hillsborough Avenue, I mean the Hillsborough Dam or the Roulette Park Dam. Um, there are two of those properties have been almost completely destroyed as a consequence of water coming down and stormwater not having an adequate place to go. So coordination between the Roulette Park Dam and the, um, the bypass is going to be critically important. So mechanisms you can put into place in order to assist homeowners to protect their properties would be very important. And I ask for your support in that area. And then lastly on item 10 where you're addressing alternative design exceptions. Um, my comment really relates to how neighborhoods are looking to try and work with the planning department in order to improve relations and to improve the trust when projects are being developed within our area. I live in the Seminole Heights area on the Hillsborough Avenue corridor, which is an area that is focused on economic development probably over the next 10 years in a significant way. The people that live on the residential streets in that area are severely concerned about the FDOT um, requirements to pretty much ignore the neighborhood's needs when it comes to development on that corridor. So we're looking for ways that we can actually work actively with the planning department and city council in order to improve the outcomes that we anticipate down the road. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Good morning, Kim Headland, 1001 East 24th Avenue. I'm here today as a BMP Board resident to speak on item number six, Cascaded Pool. First, I'd like to thank you all for keeping the conversation about the necessary repairs to Cascade on the agenda and on the administration's radar for quite some time. This is actually the fifth summer season without a pool or a fitness center or a community center or an after-school youth program at Cascaded Park. I personally had high hopes that the necessary corrective measures would be closer to reality than they are right now. I had hoped that Tampa's rich architectural and cultural heritage would be a priority and that this landmark and amenity would be on its way to serving many generations to come. At a minimum, more than four years into this conversation, I hoped that the structure would be stabilized or mothballed to ensure that it is still standing when and if funding becomes available. But after several years of discussion, and many what-if plans, and many delay tactics, unfortunately, that is still not the case. We're still just talking. The administration was quoted yesterday as saying that there is no money, but this isn't a new problem, and it isn't the first time allocations have been requested. So let's be very honest. This gate and pool, this historic landmark structure, the fitness center, the community space, and this neighborhood is not a victim of limited funding. It's simply not a current priority. I get that. And it wasn't a priority when the serious leaks first appeared more than four, more than nine years ago now, just months after a significant renovation project. To put things in perspective, $1.5 million, that was the original estimate for a potential repair. That's less than one-tenth of one percent of the budget council you all passed last summer. It's less than one percent of the CIP budget you passed. So it isn't that there is no money for capital improvements because there was money for Roy Jenkins Pool, there, were money, there was money for Williams Pool, and there's now money to study and plan for new future parks with plenty of amenities, which is terrific. But there is no money to stabilize this historic WPA structure and clearly plan for its future. And to be quite honest, that's surprising and remarkably disappointing. Our community, and more importantly, the entire city, deserves to have this jewel returned to public use. The 4,000 kids that used and visited the facility during the summer just before the pool closed should have access to this great facility and all the programming that went with it. The same way the Davis Island residents will soon benefit from the repaired and restored Roy Jenkins facility. So thank you for keeping this issue alive and on the radar, but enough is enough. I strongly encourage you not only to allocate the necessary funding to stabilize this historic structure in the upcoming 14-15 budget, 
but to implement an actionable strategy to get this facility reopened to serve the community in a positive way, to preserve campus heritage, and to celebrate our city's rich cultural diversity. No more what-if plans and no more delays. Thank you. Hello, City Council. My name is Harmony Lee Johnson, and I'm with Galaxy Fireworks. And I'm here on item number four that apparently has been pulled from the agenda. And I am asking for that to be denied if possible. This store has been allowed to operate for the last seven months without the proper permitting from the City Fire Marshal's office. Uh, I don't know what other business in the city would be allowed to operate without the proper permitting. The City Attorney's Office informed us yesterday that they have been cited for uh, violation of the, the permits not being obtained, but that is going to allow them to continue to be open in violation and open illegally. So I'm asking you to please uh, do something about this. City Attorney. Um, as you see from my memorandum, there is a pending code enforcement action as it relates to the operation without permits. And as a result of that pending code enforcement action, which is intended to be reviewed and heard in the Municipal Ordinance Violation Court, and the fact that there has been some threats of, uh, of judicial action taken against the city by the attorneys for Phantom, who also happen to be in this room, I think it would be more appropriate for me to brief you individually on this matter as opposed to having this conversation in open counsel form. All right, let me just say one final question. Are they operating at this time? They, I understand they are operating. Mr. Reddick, uh, given the fact that we are in several different potential judicial forms and in a judicial form, I think it's more appropriate for me to have that conversation with you individually as opposed to an open, um, in, in open council chambers. Anyone else, Mr. Bain? Yes, uh, when did this come to light? Uh, the, the, uh, the code, the uh, violations, the pending uh, litigation, when did this come to light? This has been ongoing since the beginning of the year. And why were we individually informed before today? Well, typically, when we're going through a code enforcement action, we don't typically individually infor uh, inform you of those matters. Again, though, I, I would remind you, we have attorneys representing Phantom Fireworks in the room right mm -hmm. here. I, we have several different judicial issues going on with this case. There is some, there are some complicating factors in it, and I would request that if you would like me to brief you individually, that would be more appropriate than having this conversation in the King Council Chamber. Today's June 4th, this was brought forth May 15th, and that's all I have to say. Well, again, again, Council, I understand what your point is, but we've typically had things come up on the agenda where there's pending action, and I've written you similar memos. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Cohen and Mr. Suarez. Thank you very much. Um, we all understand that when there are legal issues pending, that it might be better for you to talk to us in private, and, and I'm sure that everyone will welcome that discussion. We, we hadn't gotten to item number four yet. I think a 90-day continuance, though, seems to me to be, to be very excessive. Once we've all heard whatever it is you have to tell us, then maybe we can make a, form, a decision about whether or not to put it off that long or, or bring it back here. Because that, that was the one thing I saw, 90 days a long, long time. Well, the reason I put in that 90 days is since this is, this is in, a, in a process which is within the, this is not just a general code enforcement action in front of the code enforcement board. This is within a judicial municipal ordinance violation court process. I wanted to have enough time for us to know that it was going to get through that process. If you want me to come back sooner, I don't have a problem with that. And if it's still pending, I'll advise you as well. I, I think that these private conversations need to take place quickly, and then we can make a collective decision um, about whether or not to bring it forward sooner or to, to put it off well, as you request. As it remains pending, and I want to be clear, and I think this is also in your rules of procedure, while it remains pending, 
it is a pending legal matter in a judicial forum, and under your rules of procedure, it is not appropriate to have those conversations again in front of city council. If it remains pending, that's going to be the advice that I continue to give. If you want me to come back in a shorter time frame to advise you of that, I don't have any problem with that. I'll leave that to council, and I will also go ahead and make an appointment so I can meet with you individually next week. Before I go to Mr. Ford, I hope you finish. Yes. Before I go to Mr. Ford and Mr. Malion, I would entertain a motion from a council member on these two to find council member speak regarding a 30 day extension with in the first two weeks of those 30 days for yourself and your staff to meet with the individual council members along the way. Mr. Ford. Mr. Chairman, there was reference made to the council's rules, so I just want to make it uh, uh, clear what they are. Feel of, uh, remind you that council should avoid any discussion of matters at a public meeting where the city is or likely to be a party in litigation without concurrence of council. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Suarez, for this point. Thank you, Chair. Let me ask you a hypothetical question. If there is a business operating that is outside of state statute, um, what do we usually do in terms of, of that? I mean, you know, as an example, if we know that uh, this particular, uh, you know, this hypothetical, someone is going against state law, and it's been uh, brought to our attention, do we then enforce that state law based on on those conditions, or what do we usually do? The, I can answer that hypothetical by answering it. Hypothetical, in, so in, in, answer. in a general matter, it depends on the statute, depends on what the violation is. I will also tell you that this particular statute at issue is a little bit more complicated than what you would typically see in these kinds of circumstances, which is again why I asked for this to be continued. And you know, things come in, in front of code enforcement board that come up here all the time, and I've asked for similar matters. But now that I understand that city council would like to be briefed individually, I have I will go ahead and ask my assistant get this set up as soon as possible. Well, the, the question is still not answered on my okay. hypothetical, which is if you know there is a state statute <coughs> that's been passed. Rules have been uh, brought down by the uh, state governing board that rules over that particular business. How do we go about um, citing them or uh, fining them for a violation of state statute? What's the process? The only answer I can give you is it depends on the statute because okay. some of those are, are ones which the Tampa Police Department has authority over. Typically, your code enforcement actions don't have authority over there. Right. No, some I, of them I the understand. state attorney's office has authority over, that, and that some was, of them the, the state has. For a second. That's the reason for the question, yes. which is it's not a normal code enforcement uh, violation. You know, and again, I, I, I know it depends. Everything depends. It, I, but I can't this is why hypotheticals are not usually useful, except in public forums where we can't talk about particular cases. <laughs> so uh, having said all that, I understand where you're at. I understand you, the, the problems that you have. But here's the problem, and I'm going to get off the hypothetical for just a second, is that you can have a violator then hold back where the biggest, uh, the biggest uh, time of the year for the sale of this particular product is coming up. So continuance actually helps the violator. I know that that's not your concern. You are, you're looking only at the legal aspects of it. But that's the real uh, result of this. If there is no injunctive action that we can take as a city for someone to not continue to violate you know, the law, or at least come to uh, a, uh, a decision about it, it makes our enforcement uh, aspects moot for the future. Because we can keep, you know, uh, they can keep legislating, we can keep adjudicating until we're, you know, until doomsday. That's what they did during the Civil Rights Movement, the segregationists would pass a different law and make uh, everybody think that they were doing something good, when in fact they weren't. So I, I don't need an answer from you. I know that you're in a very, uh, a very, specific type of bind, but that's the issue that I have, which is when does city rules in relation to state law kick in for us to have an enforcement aspect of it without the without a uh, corresponding bad actor, uh, hypothetically, going out there and continuing to violate the law? That's the only question I have, and I, I understand why you can't answer it. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councilman Torres. Councilwoman Montoya. Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Mandel, although I didn't speak to you uh, on this matter last night, <clears throat> excuse me, I did speak to Chief Fowler because my main concern was the life safety issue. So just for our knowledge of the general public, uh, can you answer that part of the question? Is there a life safety issue um, <clears throat> with the uh, related to the inspections and the, uh, the, the, the 
volatile nature of the contents of the I will tell you that as of today, I have not been informed by the fire marshal's office that there is any life safety issue at this particular establishment. That, and you're going to have to let me kind of keep going with it because the attorney for Phantom is sitting in the room, which is one of the reasons why I was a little concerned about having this conversation. I can't tell you in the future that there won't be a life safety issue, and I want to make sure that all rights are reserved, that if there's a life safety issue, we have other options that could potentially be available to us. That, uh, that is my main concern at the moment, is the, the safety of the individuals working in the store, who visit the store, and who live near the store. So. Yes. And I, as I said, uh, as of this time, I have not been informed that there is that type of issue. Understood. And Mr. Shelby, in the in the rule that, of procedure that you referenced, um, it, since this is pending litigation, rather than having individual briefings, could we have a shade meeting, and then this way everyone could be briefed that month? No, the statute doesn't provide that because there is nothing filed yet. Well, and that, that's something is actually filed, but it has to be something where the city attorney is coming to you to get direction as it relates to potential settlement or strategy, and it is not right for that at this time, which is why I would prefer to start with individual meetings to discuss that. That's what the statute is very clearly provides for, that it is the city attorney wanting to come to the body for the purposes of either asking for settlement authority or direction on strategy, and it is too early in this matter to ask for that um, of city council. Well, I see the settlement part doesn't apply, but I thought maybe the strategy portion. We're, we're honestly not there yet. And um, you know, I have asked for those types of meetings when I have looked forward to some kind of strategy. Um, but at this point, we are not there yet. But I would, again, think that this is, now that I, you know, again, I don't, uh, when these kinds of matters come up, we don't always know that this is something the city council wants to be briefed on. Now that I know that, I will be making those appointments with you as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Councilman Ryan. Thank you, Chair. I just want to make a motion. Uh, I think it's important that we agree because it's been one of the recent points that we've seen from the producer family. Personally, it doesn't smell good. But I'm going to make a motion uh, that we report back to us on 30 days. And within those 30 days, that we can be the individual council to put us in the status of the Second. Okay, we have a uh, motion from Councilman Reddick with, a, with two competing seconds from Councilwoman Monteleone and, and Councilwoman Mulhern. We will give it to Councilwoman Monteleone. But, but uh, it, it, the, the motion was for 30 days without a date certain attached to it. I believe that that falls within our break. So could we set it for uh, June 26th with the idea that after the meetings we can always come back to it in our next meeting? Okay. Uh, with, uh, so we have a motion on the floor for a staff report on June 26th at 9 a.m. Uh, motion by Councilman Reddick, seconded by Councilman Monthly, and all those in favor, please indicate by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Um, Mr. Chair, you are back. Uh, Michael Farmer, uh, Curtis Street, East Tampa. Uh, I'm here this morning to talk to you about the uh, 22nd Street stop sign. Uh, I was contacted, I contacted the City of Tampa Transportation Department, who referred me to DOT uh, because it's a state road. Uh, I sat in traffic on 22nd Street, and I noticed that the stop sign and the selling of the Florida Central newspaper backed up traffic, which prevented the roundabout, which we, that you approved for about a million dollars, uh, uh, it backed it up, so it, it, the, the stop sign stopped it, the roundabout, from working. Okay, uh, and I'm just, I'm just, uh, Mr. Reed, Mr. Uh, Reddick, and Ms. Reed, and Councilman Miller, um, they went to DOT and had them to replace the stop sign after DOT removed the stop sign so that the roundabout could work. Now, I, I don't think this is right. Um, you know, you, we, we spent money for track, uh, road designs and everything to uh, make this thing work. And yet, him and the rest of them, they went and uh, uh, coerced or demanded DOT <coughs> to change those stop signs back. I personally don't think that no color, black, white, brown, etc., or any race, nor any community, nor any elected political official, 
should have the ability to prohibit demand or employ its DOT and matters of a state roadway traveled by the driving public, which is of all races and colors, from different communities. 22nd Street is a paid public and federal tax, paid by public and tax, uh, federal tax dollars. When political leaders seek to control DOT to violate the rights of the driving public, who has nothing to do with a stop sign or traffic light, those political leaders are in fact sending a message that the black community is dangerous to drive in. Sooner or later, people and businesses will refuse to help develop in the black community because black uh, political leaders have too much influence over DOT on state roads that lead into or through our community, and that power that they may have will adversely affect businesses to do business. 22nd Street has historically been a one-way past 21st Avenue. Now, uh, Ms. 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 Reed and the rest of them are saying, oh, I almost got hit down there because they removed the stop sign. I'm telling you right now, I got in an accident. I have metal in my leg. So it's not that I'm insensitive to accidents or what goes on down there. I'm just trying to help solve a problem. So we done spent all of this money for a roundabout, approximately a million dollars, approximately four million dollars from Lake Avenue all the way up to 21st Street. A, a, a traffic common device, a stop sign before another traffic de much. common device should not be. Thank you very much. My name is Zinga Smith. I reside at 5605 North Swanee Avenue. Um, here's the about 5, 6, 8, and 10. Uh, basically, I'm doing uh, pretty much what Ken said. It's the same thing. In regard to five with the um, house parties, do you keep in mind as far as proceeding with caution? Uh, we already have rules in place regarding noise and alcohol, and if those can be enforced before creating another layer. Um, you have neighborhoods <laughs> that will have um, you know, neighborhood building events where several households get together. I'm not going to ask everybody to pony up fifty dollars in case I get hit with a thousand dollars fine. Um, and hopefully, this Caden Park can finally see some TLC. So Kim brought up some really good points on that. Miss Heather from uh, the New York. In regard to the flooding, this is the first time with that May 5th storm that if you were trying to go north south and you were between 275 and Milford River, you could not pass. Florida Avenue became totally impassable unless you had a big rig. Central Avenue became impassable, so did Highland and Ola. You could not get across. The water came, there's a laundromat, and if you look at the leaf line, it's about halfway up their yard on there. People were cutting through the neighborhoods and finally just waited it out until it went down. Um, there was some warning that this may happen. It's the first time I had actually seen the sewers pop up the previous rainy season, and I had called to uh, Stormwater asking them if they would consider sending, you know, cleaning out the pipes, which I've never seen them do as far as what the runoff that goes down to the river. So you had, even Nebraska Avenue has some uh, restrictions. But at Comanche, at Central, Florida, and Highland, you could not go north or south unless you were on the interstate. Um, in regard to uh, 10, the alternative design exceptions. And this is a, in regard to notices, um, as Mr. Frank has brought up. Something seems to have happened with the notification system, and it's not just <coughs> um, We've received notice in our neighborhood after the fact that a design has been approved, but also it's been brought up with the S1 for the web zoning. Um, somehow bringing that back into the notification of fault, although not necessarily having a hearing, but trying to do something you know, with getting proper notifications to those who will be impacted, affected, um, you know, where there may be some issues there. Thank you. Thank you much. Anyone else?